We will continue oh. to look at the educational landscape and now coming from learnings inside the classroom to learnings from the quantum education landscape in Europe and in Germany. And uh, it's a pleasure to welcome our next speaker, Ingolf Wittmann. He's the head of business unit quantum systems at the Fraunhofer Institute for Applied Solid State Physics. And, and that's why it's a special pleasure to have him on our first Bitcoin Quantum Summit is that he's the founder and co-chair of our Bitcoin working group on high performance computing and quantum computing. He's working in the Fraunhofer Y team on the IBM project partnership in developing the first IBM Q system one quantum computer in Germany. And we're really happy to have you here in golf. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, I, yeah. My screen is shared. So thanks a lot for the nice introduction. So I like to lay out in the next uh, 10 minutes the current quantum, uh, mostly computing education landscape in Europe and Germany, where I was part of different teams who were influencing on Europe and German government level, the topic of quantum technology, which is now reflecting in some of the stimulus packages, uh, which are laid out by the government in Europe and uh, German level. So it was taking some time and uh, discussions to convince the different government bodies to take not only the base hardware technology in stimulus packages into account, but also uh, taking care about the full stack, which is including the education topic on the academia as on the industry side. We can divide these, this in three different parts, which, is, which are pretty similar to a classical computing environment, but we are talking uh, about totally different skill sets uh, to develop these three areas compared to a classical environment. Uh, the physical systems, the base layer to build systems with different technology approaches where classical quantum mechanics physicians are needed. Then the operating system layer to become independent from the hardware layer. Here is a need of a mixture of classical computer science, mathematicians, and uh, quantum physics skills. And most important, the application layer to translate industry problems into the mass of quantum mechanics. Here is a need of industry and mass skill, which are very seldom. Depending where you are and how you like to use quantum computers, you have to hire or develop these skills to be ready when the first quantum devices with quantum advantage uh, will be available. So how is the landscape looking like to support uh, these efforts? Where we are, the landscape is looking very scattered and every body is having his own interests. The government is looking to the competitiveness of the industry and the academia environment and actually raising a lot of money in on Europe, German federal and on state level. The Europe German disadvantage is the watering can method here, uh, which is end up in very many and uh, very small projects. Academia and universities are actually developing their own individual and not very synchronized programs. Even associations like uh, Bitcom are offering um, programs and certifications. Also networks like QBN or meetup communities are offering a lot of contents and events. And last but not least, the technology providers are having their own programs to push their platforms. And we will see examples later on. So what to do to get that synchronized with some best practices? Let's start with Europe and the quantum flagship program. The purpose of that project is to assist the European quantum flagship with the creation of uh, the learning ecosystem necessary to inform and educate society about quantum technology. The goal is that a quantum ready society with knowledge about a positive attitude towards quantum technology will enable the emergence of a quantum ready workforce. In different work packages, a dedicated community network should be built, giving a structured overview of the uh, 
quantum technology education community efforts that will decrease the barrier of entry for new members setting up related initiatives across Europe. A competence framework of quantum technology capabilities should be built and five different pilot programs are to be developed. That's the one part. The other part, what uh, the quantum flagship program is doing, and an example for that is the 2020 European Quantum Week, an online multi-modular event that was organized by the, quantum, uh, by the European Quantum Flagship Program with the collaboration of the European Commission. In the context of the Berlin Science Week, uh, was that uh, event held. It was covering outreach activities for general public, specialized talks and presentation for the quantum community, as well as European policy making and institutional visions for the future of Europe within the field of quantum technology. Let's move to Germany. The BMBF Future Education Program was launched in April this year with a different approach to have a collaboration between different consortia to provide industry quantum technology enablement. As I was part of the discussion with the different teams, we figured out that competing for money will not help here. Every consortia is addressing a slightly different audience in a different way. And there are even topics which have to be covered by all jointly. First, putting a certification concept in place, which will be accepted by the industry and by all education organizations providing quantum lectures and workshops which afterwards will be also a foundation for an European-wide certification approach. And second, providing a quantum infrastructure platform for the participants to get hands-on experience with different systems and technology. This was a reason why under the lead of the Fraunhofer IIF, a separate consortia out of Fraunhofer Institutes and the Jülich Research Center was founded to build a platform with different technology providers like IBM, Rigetti, Quantum Brilliance, Atos, and many more, which can be used by every consortia, but even beyond that. The advantage would be a central contact point and system access management instead of having that negotiated and implemented individually. And after three years, when the project is over, uh, the project has to be self-sufficient providing furthermore industry and academia platform services for education and research. So let's have a look what's already in place. The youngest program which is actually running is the Baden-Württemberg Competence Center of Quantum Computing, which was built to provide the initial funding for the IBM Q System 1 as first physical system outside the US. And the and to set up six different quantum research projects based on industry topics in place. Besides the projects, one important component and guideline of the state of Baden-Württemberg was the involvement of the industry as associated partners, not getting any funding, but going along with the academic project partners. In the first step, the different project consortia were thinking it will be hard to get letter of intents from the industry to get their support for the projects. But we really underestimated the, industry, uh, the interest of the industry. In a really short time, we got many LOIs back. And when we prepared the proposal for the BMBF Future Education Program, we made the same experience with the potential industry partners. It's looking like that joint quantum development and learning is the interest here. And good example is the education pilot program from uh, Fraunhofer IRO and IRF. This education pilot was to skill up people in the quantum computing programming and base math was a great experience, but also a challenge. The audience was scattered from the beginners to experts in uh, quantum mechanics. 
based, <clears throat> based on the experience we made in the pilot, we were adjusting the content and layout and will offer on a regular basis to, to the academic project partners of the competence center, but also to the associated industry partners where a big interest is in it. Another example is the offer from the Bitcom Academy with an uh, quantum education program, including a certification component in second half of uh, 2021 in cooperation with ATOS. And here we do have uh, in the first uh, uh, effort and certification uh, uh, approach in, in place, which has to be uh, industry-wide accepted. Ingolf, I'm very, uh, it's very sad and heartbreaking for me to do the interruption while you're presenting our Bitcom offers, but time is running. Nevertheless, thank you very much uh, for giving your quick insights and the deep dive into the German and European education landscape. And for you, if you're interested in learning more about what Fraunhofer does and what our other premium partners, Artis and Fujitsu do, feel free to check out the partner stage where you will have access to more information and representatives from the companies be available to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Ingolf. Um, yeah, we saw that training the quantum workforce is quite an important and quite a thrilling topic if we want to stay innovative and if we want to catch up with the quantum revolution. So for the next 40 minutes, we will dive deeper into the topic. We'll talk about successful training and reskilling in the industry, but also in schools but we will also look at the challenges and hurdles along the way. And it's a pleasure for me to introduce the next moderator to you. It's our own Alexandra Großeholt. She's the head of events at Bitcom. The stage is yours, Alexandra. Have fun and have a great conversation. If you want to join the conversation, feel free to use our hashtag Quantum Summit 21 and use the chat to engage and ask questions. The stage is yours. Thank you very much, Kim. Hello and welcome everyone to our panel on quantum education, training the quantum workforce. Before we start, I would also like to invite you to participate via the chat with questions and I will try to take up as many questions as possible. For this discussion, we have invited five experts. The first one is Professor Dr. Bettina Just. For many years, she managed projects in life insurance companies and specialized on migration projects of life insurance portfolios. Since 2010, she's a professor of mathematics and computer science at THM University of Applied Science. She teaches quantum computing classes and is the coordinator of the Quantum and HAVN network, which is the platform for members of universities of applied sciences to develop teaching inspired by practical applications. Welcome, Bettina. Hi. Our next. Hi, our next guest is Professor Dr. Rainer Müller. Rainer Müller is professor for physics education at the Technical University Braunschweig, and he received his PhD in theoretical physics in Constance. He then moved to physics education research for his habilitation on the teaching and learning of quantum physics at LMU Munich. Welcome, Rainer. Next one is Clara Neumeyer. Clara Neumeyer heads the business unit executive education of the Fraunhofer Academy. Her business unit organizes over 40 different technical training programs with more than 5,000 participants each year. Clara's scope of responsibility includes the strategical business development, product development, portfolio and stakeholder management with universities and Fraunhofer Research Institutes. Her major focus is on working on interdisciplinary projects based on the collaboration between multiple Fraunhofer Institutes from different areas. Her team and her are responsible for creating new technology specific trainings and recently also on the topic of quantum computing. Welcome, Clara. Next one is Manfred Rieck. Manfred Rieck is VP Individual Solution Development at DB Systel. He has been with DB Systel since 2013 and taken on the leadership of the Quantum Computing Research Group, in which the industrial um, suitability of the technology is examined. The group is focusing at security aspects of quantum computing and at optimization problems for logistic companies with quantum computers. He also holds an MBA from the University of Reading UK and he is a qualified computer scientist at Rheinische Friedrich Wilhelms University of Bonn. 
And of course, last but not least, Jan Wender. Jan is a senior expert in the ad ATOS expert community and the pre-sales organization for the areas of high performance computing and quantum computing. In this context, he has been involved in the large HPC projects of the data centers in Germany for many years. Since 2016, he is deeply engaged with quantum computing as part of the ATOS product and innovation strategy and has given presentations on this topic at numerous conferences. So a warm welcome to every one of you and thank you very much for being here today. Since the time is limited, let's jump directly into our topic. Um, so maybe we'll start with uh, Bettina. So quantum computing and quantum physics have the reputation of being extremely difficult. Where or when should quantum education start? <laughs> yeah, as early as possible. And it has, the, of course, it has the problem that, it, um, that quantum computing involves a lot of different materials, mathematics, computer science, physics, all these three areas. And I, sh I think it should start um, in fact, at, uh, with very little children uh, in, in, the, in the elementary school to, to give them basic of logical thinking and also to be open for new experiences and so on. And it should continue uh, throughout the whole school, I think. Yeah, um, Rainer, we, we have to see how to proceed. Yeah, of course. Rainer, how do you, do you see that? And do you know like some principles of good science communication? If we think about yeah, uh, teaching already a little kids? Yes, I don't believe in little kids actually. That's more the topic of outreach. But I think it should start at high school. And there, one must say quantum computing is not that difficult at all. It is maybe easier than the stuff we are already doing at high school. Uh, we are caring for atoms and spectral lines and continuous variables. And quantum computing, mathematically, it's two by two matrices or four by four matrices and so on. Uh, so it can be, there has to be some development of, of curricular concepts that is tackled now, for example, within the European pilot programs. And I'm quite enthusiastic about teaching quantum computing at high school. That will happen. Okay, Bettina, from your experience, what basics do students do to understand quantum technologies? Um, there are a lot of them who, who are afraid of mathematics because it's in their in their genes. I don't know they are afraid of mathematics. And so for the Fachhochschulen University of Applied Sciences, that's what I'm here in this panel for, is the art is to teach it and using as 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 little as possible requisites, uh, pre prerequisites from, from, from physics and from mathematics. Okay, so let, let's try to build also the bridge between academia and industry a yes. bit. So uh, maybe Clara, um, can you give us some examples for successful training and, and education in the industry? Yes, for sure. I mean, in terms of successful trainings, we definitely are in a stage of, or in a really, really early stage. We are just building those trainings up and we have to find out first what kind of requirements are out there for this technology. Because when I come up from Fraunhofer side, I say this and this and this is important and maybe everything is on the same level of importance. But for our target groups and for our customers, maybe there are totally different angles of of, of deep dives important. So what we're doing right now is um, to figure out first what kind of target groups need to know how deep uh, the technology. And we have definitely tech experts here throughout the whole Bitcoin Summit um, who need really in-depth knowledge and also the combination between the different disciplines. But I think it's really important as well to first, or not to first, but parallel, always to trigger different target groups in the industry, for example, consultants, CEOs, startups, or also innovation management people who are sort of figuring out what kind of potential does this new technology have. So I think this is the first step we have to trigger to find out first and um, to sort of at least uh, get a bit more insight what are the actual requirements from, from those people to figure then out a modular concept where people can pick the modules they need and maybe not need to go in depth 
uh, as other people in, in a team. And then we can work in a team, really collaborative, and then figure out what's, what's the right training um, path. So it's not a program. It's more a path where people have to go through and uh, take the models they need. Thank you. So uh, Manfred, maybe you want to add something. And also, I would like to ask, what do you think uh, which uh, like a kind of specialists do we need? So we do not only need like the hardware and the operating systems, but we also need uh, like people. And uh, as Clara also mentioned, founders, CEOs, for example. Um, how do you see this? Yeah, I think we, we need uh, several perspectives. Um, on one hand, one very successful education program, um, what we know is from Helsinki, the AI Academy. So within the AI Academy, Helsinki was able to educate uh, 650,000 people, uh, the, more or less the whole country, on AI. So this is the, let's say, the fundament for, for everything um, around AI. And I think we need uh, something like this um, on the long term in the quantum perspective as well. So um, we were joking when we came together in this group and said we are some, some of us are working with Lochkarten uh, some years ago and others are already digital natives. And um, I suppose we sometimes we need some quantum natives. So it, uh, I suppose will be the next steps because it's completely different approach in software development. And uh, so what, what we need at the moment is um, experienced uh, software developers um, Enable and enable them to work with uh, quantum technologies, especially uh, quantum computing at the moment. So they, they know how to build the software tools at the moment and uh, their software at the moment. And uh, we need uh, some, some courses, some education for uh, senior developers to get them on track with um, quantum because it's um, more or less completely new for them and uh, the approaches are completely different. So this is what we've learned during the, the cloud migration. So we had to change our software development processes to um, become a cloud native. Um, in, 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 we changed um, our more or less the, the organizations towards DevOps organizations to uh, develop cloud native applications, uh, knowing what containers are. And this is what, what we need now as well. Not only the, let's say the, the academic view, I think at the moment, 95% of courses are on an academic. What we need is courses for the industry where we can send our people, our experienced people, to learn basics of quantum computing and then use it um, as early as possible in real um, business use cases. So coming out of the academia and uh, going right into the industry. Maybe if I may, yeah. may I answer directly. Uh, to, yes, to a few points here. Um, first one, I'd like to object a little bit uh, to your use of the term long term. I don't think we don't we have this really this much time to get uh, started with education and quantum computing because, well, this is uh, our perspective. We think in in about two or three years time frame we will have the first practical uses for quantum computers. Uh, so, if I am looking at to make use of this in my company or in my institute or whatever, I need to get started now. Mm. Otherwise, the technology will be there and the other people who have started already will be able to use it. Um, and, and then in a competition, uh, uh, I, I will have a, a disadvantage. So I, I think we should get started now and, and should get started with the education now. I agree the education has to be on uh, several dimensions, so to say. We, we need one educational path for the specialists who need to understand how to program a quantum computer. But I think there also needs to be a bit more of a differentiation. Um, my background is as a computational linguist and uh, not a physicist. So I'm really struggling with these uh, physical properties of, of quantum systems. Um, and I guess that will be the same for many other people who work in, in computer programming. Maybe not computer science, but computer programming, which is uh, the large area where computers are used today. Um, and so I think we need to have some kind of um, yeah, second level there. We need to find more abstractions for the actual quantum hardware, uh, put some software layers of abstractions on it, and then we can have an easier interface for computer programmers to make use of this quantum hardware. So that is the, the specialist path, but also 
for kind of the general public, what um, you said about the AI program from Finland was quite interesting. Uh, I think we need really have to have something similar for, for quantum computing as well. It is a technology which will, which will change certain aspects of how we are using computers today and in, in a fundamental way. And that needs to be understood by everyone who is making use of a computer somewhere. And that is basically all of us. Yeah. Okay, if we go back to the specialists, we have one question from the audience and then I will come back to you, Bettina. So uh, uh, someone is asking, um, that the impression from this conference, but also from other conferences, that there are significantly less women than men in the field. And so I think it's obvious there's a lack of, of women. So maybe someone of you wants to, to answer this question and also uh, give us an idea of how we could help with that. I made just a quick comment. In my view, in quantum computing, actually, we have more women than in other fields of computing. <laughs> Exactly. So this is, uh, I agree. Yes. I agree with Jan. So the, the deeper you go into the technology, the more women are um, engaged in this uh, technology. This is very, uh, very interesting. It's not in the AI. In the AI, it's uh, completely different, but um, we have a lot of um, specialized women in quantum computing at the moment. I think it's interesting, maybe the impression in terms of a quantum summit, like we have, we are here today, who is the person who's speaking actually on the panel? So this might be still maybe uh, pretty male dominated, but from front of a perspective, for example, I can definitely uh, agree with what Manfred is saying. We have like totally different areas we're working with. We're working with people in the AI sector, but also in the production area or whatever other kind of fields. And this is mainly uh, male dominated. And the quantum team in Fraunhofer, for example, is a really unique team, I think, as it is just a 50-50% uh, ratio right now. And I think it's um, the first time actually, it was in our experience, it's one of the first um, teams we sort of brought together from totally different kind of fields and from totally different kinds of other backgrounds. Even the gender um, topic is different. We have a lot of uh, female and male participants in our team, but also from the age difference. We have totally different people coming together in one table. As we have the digital natives, they are really important for this kind of uh, topic, but we also need the people who are working in this area for a really long time and have the knowledge already to bring on the table. So I think it is a chance actually to bring a lot of diverse people together. And I think diverse in every single um, case. But I think it's still a really important topic to talk about for sure, as we have to uh, sort of figure out who's speaking here today and to engage uh, female um, people in the Mint area for sure. Perfect, thank you. Then I will hand over uh, directly to Bettina. Yes, I perfectly agree with that. It's the same. Uh, it's the same at the universities of applied science. Professors are mostly male, but students are, are half and half, I'd say. And so it's to encourage women to take also to take leading positions and do it <laughs> and to give maybe examples. Why I raised my hand is because uh, I was thinking about the, the small and little companies in the in this in the geographical surroundings of Fachhochschulen. This is one of the strengths of the Fachhochschulen that they are locally very well connected since years, since decades of years to the to the enterprises surrounding them to the companies and know know them very well and if we go to them and ask well how about quantum computing they'd say which profit will it bring to me and when of course they think like this uh, so we have to say well uh, at the moment mm, no profit uh, and and a quantum computer can do only very small things and so the question is how to get them to our boat and i think the idea would be to ask them, well, if, if there was a quantum computer at this moment, a big one, how would it affect your business? Just think about this question for two hours. It's, uh, and this is a way one can talk to the management because um, time is a, rare, is a rare thing for the small and little uh, enterprises. And it, before someone comes to, to have a lecture with us, it's necessary to convince the management of the companies that it will be useful for them. 
I think what we could use here is the analogy to artificial intelligence. Yes. A neural networks is a technology which was invented in 1950. Then it took quite a long time on the back seat uh, to get developed. And then NVIDIA found out that they could compute these uh, things very well on their GPUs. And then it has an, an explosive growth. So if you looked at uh, neural networks in like 2010, um, and started out working with it, you would have a clear advantage um, using this technology. And I guess that will be the same for quantum computing. Um, I'm, uh, Bettina, I, I didn't agree completely uh, that this is only a um, question for the SMEs. I think it's for the, for, the large, for the large organizations as well. So for example, in Deutsche Bahn, um, you know what we are doing um, usually when we don't have Corona. Um, so we are we investing at the moment in this topic because we know that will that it will come. We don't know exactly when. So Jan says two years, others say five years, um, but we know that we um, need experience in the organization, and uh, we know that it's a kind of experiment, and uh, that this is an investment where you can't calculate a real business case, and this is. For large uh, DAX companies, it's not the same. So some large DAX companies are already engaged in the industry group um, in, in Jülich, and um, other DAX companies are completely um, out of uh, quantum computing because they are working with hydrogen or with uh, new, 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 new energy approaches, and they are not looking at this new technology. So um, I agree with you on the other hand, we need to convince management, so senior management, and this is what Clara said as a target group, um, to give some, um, some education, what does quantum computing or quantum technology really mean from a, from a computing perspective, from a security perspective, from a sensor perspective, when you look for IoT devices, and um, I think, so there we need several different levels in, in the education. Rainer, uh... Yes, and I also think, think it's um, important to build that ecosystem, that broad ecosystem of different specialists we are now heading for. Um, now the development is driven by physicists and physicists think like physicists do. Mm -hmm. We have engineers and information scientists and we even have a computer linguist here, um, all bring their perspectives and we have all followed the development of uh, computers. Um, we are now with quantum in a stage maybe where the first integrated circuits uh, are developed. And at that time in the 70s, nobody would have envisioned the smartphone and Instagram and TikTok and things like that. So we need people with fresh ideas who develop these quantum ideas. There's so much, there's so much to be found in this area. And I think we just need that ecosystem. And this is a matter of education, generating quantum literacy, making quantum natives is something, uh, someone, some of you said it earlier. We need these people. So uh, we have so many aspects of quantum education, but I would like to pick up uh, one theme that uh, Manfred uh, like uh, um, mentioned just in a short sentence and Corona. So I would like to, to ask you, uh, in general, what are the biggest uh, structural challenges and uh, maybe are there chances because of the current situation? So, so one chance um, which, um, which we use at the moment is uh, the exactly this uh, Zoom stuff, this uh, digital um, option to, um, to go into education, into online education. And not classroom education and learn uh, whatever you find um, in the internet. So um, we use um, online courses from say Udemy, Udacity, Coursera, um, Brilliant and to, to learn this stuff. And because what we see at the moment, there is a um, large education stuff in universities, but for, uh, let's say for, for senior uh, people, it's uh, difficult to join them because they are um, in their uh, normal working mode. And so they, they use their free time or they get some free time to, um, to uh, get into online courses. So this is an advantage, one of the advantages, the, mm -hmm. only, the only Corona advantage. <laughs> Yeah, so that's the one advantage for the 
not only digital natives, but also for those who are working for long term and, and those topics. So Clara, you've raised your hand. So maybe I would add one different aspect as well to add on this. Um, if we think about trainings, it's oftentimes our certain time where we focus on a certain topic we want to learn and then we go back to our companies, to our old processes and to our old environment. The chances of digital learning and this new way of learning, how we sort of saw it in the last year, gave us the chance to actually be in their, in their processes, in their life, to actually bring the education programs to them in their environment. We even sort of think what kind of tools are our customers using so we bring our trainings in their tools so we can actually be there for them in a different kind of way. Mm. So we think of application, how we can actually apply this whole knowledge to the people in on their working desk and stuff like that. I see a chance which makes it different now to think more in a learning journey. So to come back and to sort of um, consult them for a longer time or to connect in different times uh, in different times throughout the learning process. And it's not cut after maybe a two day training course. So you see in terms of application to apply the knowledge what people learn, a huge potential for the future. And especially if you sort of try to find um, your knowledge you actually need, because sometimes you're coming for a training for a one week training and actually not the whole um, five day training is made for you or for your for your course. So you can make it more module, more flexible and more bringing it more to the people themselves and their their problems, actually. Rainer, you wanted to add something? I think that, yes. Uh, it's quite amazing what you now see, uh, for example, on the European scale. Uh, within the quantum flagship in the education part, we have created working groups and pilots. And education always, always was a very national affair because it occurs in the national language and uh, it's not so much connected within Europe. But the new uh, possibility of having quick exchanges via video conferences uh, which just emerged right in the, in the, during the last year, um, has brought a great exchange within Europe with it. And that's a very good development uh, that, we, that we can make use of now. Perfect. And um, uh, Bettina, uh, uh, I would like to ask you, uh, what do you think are the biggest like conceptual challenges? Also, Clara mentioned in the little bit with. So in education and training, what, yeah, what has to be considered to, to like make a bigger approach to students? Yeah, Clara said the word modularity, and I, I think this is the core concept to see who needs what, and and to to tailor things to small units which are self-contained to a little, uh, which are self-contained and which are small and and can be put together to give a personalized training to somebody who needs it. And the needs are completely different. We, ha we have good experiences uh, with enterprises in the field of quantum sensorics. But here, I think there are material specialists and physicists are working together and they are closely together from, from, their, from, from where they come from their education. Now we are going at least to me, it seems we are now going in Germany, really the step from the physical quantum bit to the logical quantum bit, which means we go the step from physicists, phys physics to computer science. And the challenge is to see who needs what I think computer science, who wants to applicate quantum computing in computer science does not need the complete physics. But the question is, what does this person need? And this is a challenge to, to design these modules. Yeah, that's a very interesting and a big a challenge. Um, so within the last six months, as a, a Germany and the European Union have set up uh, programs like Future Education and QT Edu. Mm -hmm. And uh, what do you think? So who wants first? Is this the right way, the right approach? Or should we take another direction? I mean, I can start in terms of, 
first of all, I really appreciated that the BMBF saw the potential in how important it is to educate people, to understand what those people who are already experts in are talking about. You know, we have to brighten um, the, the understanding in that. So I appreciate that they spend money and they got out this call so early as well. It's untypical, I would say, for us as a research organization. A lot of time we have a lot more research time beforehand and then afterwards we're thinking about how can we educate people in this area. So I appreciate the timing that it came quite early for, 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 for German um, tradition. What I maybe should add, what I think is good or could be even more better is to, instead of creating a competition between people who are applying for this topic, to encourage, and this was said in the Bitcom Summit a lot of times, to encourage people in getting to know each other and work together closer. I definitely appreciate the encouragement and engagement, for example, from Raina, who sort of tried to put those people together to talk to each other. And this is something what we need to do more often, to collaborate and talk to each other, to find out what is the right thing and how we can adjust it. The area is huge. The people are so diverse. The, the, the context where we are coming from is so different. Everything is important if we bring it together and if we can combine such a community. And therefore, I think it's good that they sort of invented the module two to bring those people even together. But I think it was also really important from the mindset of the people who are actually here today as well and to engage is important to be willing to be open to talk about it, to be willing to share what they, they have in mind and bring together maybe a even bigger part and uh, not have the competition between us in Germany or even in Europe being more combined and um, working together for, you know, in a global perspective, not against other people, but, you know, in a, in a joint force might be more helpful. That's my opinion. Bettina, do you want to add something? Yeah, only for short, I'm a very fan of uh, Rainer Müller's uh, quantum education landscape. Which was uh, which was done in the European project, and here it's it's a very good, a very shape where one sees what can one know theoretically about quantum sciences, not only quantum computing but quantum sciences, and it's uh, it helps so much to position the own position on this landscape. It's it it simplifies discussions. So I want to make some publicity for this quantum. Uh, That's great. That's great. In fact, this is a competence framework we created for the European Commission, which has uh, also made a great effort in education. And um, it aims to structure the field, uh, as Bettina said, what, what can you know, what are you able to know in, in quantum technologies? And that's where we tried uh, to yeah, model uh, this, this, uh, this competences. I must also uh, agree with, with Clara, the, the collaborative spirit in the community is really amazing to see. Uh, it's not only in education, although in the scientific uh, areas where we have really not a spirit of competition, but of collaboration. The competition is not within Germany, it's not within Europe, it's outside China, the US, these are our competitors maybe. We have to collaborate. I think this is this is really the message we need to convey. And uh, to answer the original question, I think it's very good um, to put money into education because this is really good, well invested money. Uh, everything you put in education, it will come out later. But um, what one would need more is. Um, programs started to high school. Uh, there are some outreach programs which are addressed to the general public, but they are, uh, the aim is to generate motivation uh, and to generate a good, yeah, good attitude towards quantum technologies. But you need, really need also programs uh, for high school students that uh, learn something about quantum physics, quantum technologies in school. And these things have to be developed. They are not already there somewhere. They have to be developed. And I think it's possible really to teach quantum physics in high school. And we, we are on a, on a, in a good position in Germany because we have 
we have the experts, we have the people, we have also well-educated teachers who have had quantum physics during their uh, university studies. These are all things we can use. So you've mentioned also the programs at high schools, and we have a, a question from the audience. We've already touched this topic, but again, I would like to address Jan. As someone is, uh, is also asking about the current challenge to get uh, computer uh, science students into the quantum computing. And maybe Jan, you can share experience, and then Bettina and Rainer can maybe give us a, a, yeah, a view from the academic side. It's a question from Robert Charder, right? How we can get yes. <laughs> uh, the uh, computer science students into quantum computing. And well, I agree that we need to do that, and, and we need to do that quickly. Um, but I'm not that much in touch with computer science students, so I'm not that knowledgeable about their motivations on how to select topics for deeper study. I mean... So maybe I will hand over to Bettina or Rainer. <laughs> motivating factor, it's a future technology which will turn certain things in our technology upside down and that should generate mm -hmm. some interest to, to work with it in itself, I, I think, but maybe you can add some perspective on that. I think that will come because uh, quantum computing is, is the new rocket science. It's cool, they like it. And uh, if I, in, in a course with my students, I, I tell them, you want to calculate on a, on a quantum computer, on a real quantum computer, there's a possibility, for example, at IBM to make an account and log in and uh, calculate on a real, on the real thing, not in a, yeah, it's, they find it amazing, they like it. And I, I think it's, it's really cool at the moment. Perfect. So yeah, no, Bettina. Yeah. yeah, if it's okay. Um, we go step by step. There are the normal computer science bachelor and master uh, degrees, degree programs. And what we do is we have quantum computing as a facult facultative course. One can select quantum computing if one wants, and the curious ones come. <laughs> and mm -hmm. then some of them uh, get in fire with the topic and want to continue. And now, also in Germany, there, there are, I know about this, but it's not uh, at the Fachhochschulen, there are programs, master degrees in quantum technologies um, are being made now. I think that's the way. Okay, so we have another question. I think, unfortunately, this will also be the last uh, question. It's more about workforce than education, but how can we keep people with those quantum skills in Europe? And what can Europe offer compared to big tech companies in the US and China? So uh, feel free, whoever starts. Um, I think um, I can give an answer. So maybe some of you know Jan Götz. He has been in the speech some minutes ago. He's one of the founders of IQM and he moved over to Helsinki because the uh, environment in Helsinki was much easier to um, for founding such an organization, they are developing hardware. And um, so what, what I see at the moment is that uh, people stay in Germany when the, um, the topic is interesting. And uh, what we see as well is the, uh, the studies are on a very high level, or universities on a very high level. They are not um, on a higher level in, in the US, neither in, in China. And um, what we do at the moment is we have the roadmap in place since uh, January this year. So we know what we are doing in terms of quantum computing. And I'm not sure whether we have too few interested uh, students or um, senior developers. Uh, what I see at the moment is more we have uh, too many and we don't have enough offers for them. So uh, what we need is kind of summer school. Maybe Clara, we speak, uh, speak afterwards what we can do with Fraunhofer. Um, because the, I think the, uh, the, the, the place for quantum computing um, in Germany is at the moment place to be. So when you, when you see which, uh, what, what, what is going on with the alliances at the moment with uh, money from the uh, BMW I and the BMF, um, I suppose uh, this is the place where um, you can do more or less everything in, um, in terms of quantum computing. So thank you very much, Manfred. Unfortunately, the time is already up. And even if we could fill a whole day with the topic, uh, yeah, we have to come to an end. So I think in a summary, it uh, can be emphasized how important it is to tackle the topic together in our network. And I'm also uh, curious to hear more about your collaboration 
collaboration in, in this group. Um, so I'd like to thank you very much to uh, to all of your you panelists. Uh, thank you for your time and all the insights. And now I think we can um, together watch the presentation, which is coming uh, after this panel from Jan. And we are really looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.